Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have our show, Talking Science and Tech, and we'll talk about the Hyperloop experiment, and I'm calling it experiment advisedly, which has been done recently in Nevada. We have with us D. Raghunandan, who's been following transportation technologies for quite some time. Raghu, if we look at this example, this case, which has been touted as a test run, it seems to be a very uh, preliminary exercise and best it can be called proof of concept, but really nothing more than that. It was only yeah. roughly about 100 miles per hour. That even 100 years back, a steam engine could have done that. So that's not particularly, uh, shall we say, exciting technology if we look at just the test parameters. So what does it yeah. really show? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you because, in fact, even as a proof of concept, I believe it is inadequate because the whole concept of the hyperloop is that you accelerate up to very high speeds and then uh, you really don't put in too much energy in running the system because the momentum itself is expected to carry the pod uh, forward. So, the I mean, that's where the real energy uh, balance of the Hyperloop system and its supposed advantage over other systems would have come into play. So, so at this time, all that we know is that, yes, you can run a pod inside a tube. Uh, <laughs> beyond that, I don't see how much more has been done and I have not seen yet the data of what the pressure was like inside that uh, tube. So how much of low pressure or uh, etc. was created. Let's take a step back and talk about the Hyperloop itself. As a technology, yeah. it's supposed to be near vacuum conditions, so the air resistance is much lower. It's supposed to be magnetic levitation, so you don't have rails, you're really running on a, a cushion of magnetic uh, repulsion, as it were, so that you, the whole uh, rail coach is above the uh, so called tracks. And then there is no resistance except air resistance. Then what you're talking about is the air resistance is in fact the major component of the problem. And yep. if you have then a vacuum, then of course the air resistance is not there. Yep. So the magnetic levitation, which is been used, is also being used in the different places. That runs into the problem of cost of transportation when the uh, air resistance becomes high. That's right. With high speeds it does. So yep. this does not show. Uh, that part of it exactly. can actually do exactly. high speeds and the resistance is therefore shown to be much less, right. that doesn't happen. That's right. So that's uh, the without way. that, you've not really proved the concept that the hyperloop was supposed to uh, be. And the other part of it is that this is basically just half a kilometer track yeah. in Nevada. And uh, there you have this... Uh, Pod, which had two people in it. And so you all that you showed is that you can run a pod in uh, magnetic levitation. Now, yeah. again, magnetic levitation, uh, Bangalore is a known concept. Known concept. And I think this is this has been there for almost 70, 75 years, yeah. that as a concept. And yeah. uh, we have had functioning uh, Bangalore systems from 70s onwards. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, right. So, uh, the maglev concept is quite different, of course, from what the Hyperloop was supposed to be. The Hyperloop incorporates the uh, magnetic concept by having induction motors around the outer tube through which the pod is uh, propelled. So the two things that you would expect from a Hyperloop demonstration uh, is number one, acceleration to high speeds inside the uh, uh, outer shell, the, the, the tube. And then from there, the continued propulsion largely using momentum and not requiring much energy input uh, in terms of this. Now, clearly in half a kilometer, you're not going to either achieve the high speeds that you're looking for, nor would you have uh, constructed the low pressure near vacuum conditions, which will enable onward propulsion using largely momentum already generated, which would then give you high speeds at relatively lower cost. Uh, so neither of those we have seen so far. So, so but uh, do we then see at least that a tube through which this 
works as distinct from the normal maglev that we are seeing around at least that has been yeah yeah so at least you have seen that inside a tube you can have a pod going and it's not clashing against the sides <laughs> i mean that but you know uh, the fact is that till now over about 400 tests have been conducted by virgin hyperloop by htt by the former hyperloop one company without people sitting inside uh, has already demonstrated travel of the pod inside the uh, tube uh, which demonstrates the things so all you've done is you've put two people inside to show that yeah it can carry people but the same thing could have been done by using two dummies uh, as well which also has been done by the way so it's a bit like the uh, manned moon uh, exploration the as it was argued before the, during and later you didn't really have to have human beings going to moon you could just yeah. send cameras grabs and so on yeah. which is what we have done subsequently but the idea of the hyperloop is of course it's supposed to revolutionize transport now coming back to what is the difference in terms of performance of a hyperloop system if it does come about in terms of the speeds and what is it supposed to do in terms of cost of transportation is yeah. it significantly different in terms of speeds first and then of course we'll come to the cost question yeah uh, the two aspects are the speeds expected to be reached are in the range of 1000 to 1200 kilometers per hour uh, those are the expected uh, speeds expected to be uh, transonic uh, speeds which is why the name hyper loop came about because it is supposed to be well not really hypersonic but transonic uh, at least so about 1200 kilometers per hour uh, speeds uh, which then would mean as i said earlier if you reach that kind of uh, speed then the rest of the journey is expected to be covered largely by the momentum already generated not requiring further inputs of energy and that is what differentiates it from either maglev or high speed rail which require continued inputs of energy for the journey here because you have got these near vacuum tubes and air resistance is so low once you have propelled the pod and achieved high speeds it virtually runs on its own for the rest of the journey so the economy was supposed to lie in lower running costs uh substantially lower running costs that was number 1 and the claim was that it would cost about 40 to 50 million dollars per kilometer in terms of the capital costs of the infra uh, structure whereas you are getting high speed rail or maglev systems approximately at 10 to 12 million uh, dollars so the argument of elon musk and the other champions of hyperloop has been that countries which seek to establish uh, high speed uh, rail may as well spend a little more money and establish hyperloop which according to the promoters then uh, although this is mimicking rail uh, systems the time taken would be com comparable to air travel uh, that was the selling point because at 1200 kilometers per hour you are aiming at something like a delhi bombay run in about 45 minutes uh, or under an hour uh, which is shorter even than your air uh, travel so that was supposed to be the selling point and then if you compare it with rail you've got a let us say uh, chennai bangalore journey which takes today by about 4 hours by indian so called super fast uh, express and may take about 2 hours uh, by high speed rail uh, etc the promise was that this kind of distance of 400 odd kilometers you would be able to do in half an hour to 40 minutes so th these are the uh, claims for the kind of systems that were there in terms of time speeds and costs quickly on the question of course of the speeds the current maglev systems looks like it can scale up to 600 to 800 kilometers uh, speed 
my kilometers per hour. And 600 is sort of near 600 kilometers uh, per hour speeds are being achieved in the trial runs already. Yeah. So it's not something which is very far away. And also, if you look at the cost, what you talk about the capital cost, of course, as we know, capital costs always go up. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Plan for the system, if you say exactly. X, it end up, it becomes two Absolutely. X, and that we have seen even Absolutely. in systems. But the Maglev is now a relatively established technology. Uh, it, in fact, Shanghai airport to, to Shanghai city center, this has been running for some time. And earlier also, it was running in UK and I think another uh, place. Uh, Germany. Germany. The, both are not commercially running any. any. Yeah. But, Even Russia uh, had a system that's also not commercially running. Commercially running anymore. But the reality is that maglev systems now have been tried out, tested extensively. And therefore, what Japan is doing, what South Korea is doing, and what China is doing, all of them seem to have gone now to uh, the direction that they can put it as a part of the high-speed railway systems. So in that yeah. sense, this would be, the Hyperloop would be completely something quite different and a yeah. lot of new challenges which would have to go through. Yeah. So there is a difference between the maturity of the uh, maglev systems today and what the Hyperloop try, would try to do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the only thing about the maglev is, like you said, uh, the current only commercially running maglev is the Shanghai uh, uh, system over seven to eight kilometers uh, distance. Kilometers. Uh, the other ones have not really established themselves commercially. Uh, be partly because there is already a reasonably well established network of high speed rail uh, in Europe and they did not see such great advantage in substituting those with maglev uh, systems. So they seem to be quite happy doing this because maglev will then involve new infrastructure, etc., etc. So they didn't see the percentage of shifts. China has always been a slightly different case, including in high speed rail. Uh, uh, China did not have a very extensive railway system earlier to begin with, so they leapfrogged into high-speed rail and they were prepared to invest the capital in doing that, whereas most of the other countries had a fairly well laid out railway system, which they partly transformed into high-speed rail and partly added new, completely new uh, infrastructure. And the same step seems to be the case with the maglev uh, system where the Chinese have felt more free uh, in doing that uh, as well. The other uh, issue with this regard is that uh, uh, the uh, Hyperloop system, although it is frequently compared with high-speed rail and uh, uh, maglev systems, essentially really competes with air travel in terms of the time uh, factor like I was giving you examples of the Delhi Mumbai uh, etc thing so the real uh, comparison in terms of time saving and cost uh, is in relation to air travel and the uh, sales argument of the hyperloop promoters including Elon Musk is when you're getting the advantage of air, <coughs> air travel like speeds and times why would you invest comparable amounts of money on high-speed rail? Although, as we've discussed, the cost can be actually quite substantially higher than high-speed rail, could be as much as four to five times, if not more. Uh, the other question that you asked, maybe we could discuss this uh, in a separate uh, uh, part, which is uh, the kinds of problems you're likely to encounter with Hyperloop which have not been foreseen so far and which could then uh, raise substantial entry barriers, uh, pose problems in terms of regulatory uh, systems and both these put together would further push up costs uh, compared to what we know today. Yeah, and Raghuna, just a quick uh, comment on the Chinese issue. They have 36,000 kilometers installed as of uh, this year already. 
and uh, therefore they really are far ahead of rest of the yeah. world in terms of high speed rail yeah. and the maglev also both they and the japanese seems to be quite uh, into it they also have they're not looking at long distances also they're looking at maybe uh, what Chinese, the japanese are doing from osaka to uh, Tokyo. That's right. the first length would be Nagoya to Tokyo. Yeah. China would also do Shanghai to Beijing. Now, yeah. there, of course, this is an infrastructure cost that you are building. So the question when Elon Musk says, why would you do that uh, when you can actually do a hyperloop? Why would you do maglev and so on? The argument would be that this has to run on the ground. Therefore, you have huge issues regarding land acquisition, getting right of the way, building that infrastructure and so on, unlike air travel, for instance. Yeah, so if absolutely. you're going to get the same advantage, the only yeah. argument could be how many people can travel, the number of people traveling could be much more, which doesn't yeah. seem to be the case either. And in fact, one of Elon Musk's winning points in this, in his argument is supposedly, you can go park your car inside the pod and then drive off on the other side, which could appeal to Americans, but the rest yeah. of the world doesn't seem to be very interested in this particular concept. Yeah. I mean, the, the, that's, the, that's the other advantage, which the Hyperloop, unlike the uh, air uh, travel, is expected to benefit by giving you connection in the heart of the city, uh, rather than on the outskirts like you have with an airport. It's like high-speed rail. You go into the heart of the city and get into the train. And like that, you'll be able to get into your pod in a Hyperloop uh, uh, tube uh, right in the heart of the city. So it will take you from one business district that, to the business okay, so district you reach. That works if it is a Los Angeles, San Francisco kind of scenario. Exactly. But if you're exactly. going from Delhi to Mumbai, okay, yeah. or going from Delhi to Chennai, that may not be the major argument because then the Shanghai row, route, which is you go to the airport, Pudong airport, and then go to Shanghai city center, eight minutes in a maglev might be a better option. Yeah. So, you know, if you're interested in shortening that journey, then a maglev to the center of the city probably is a better investment than investing in the whole route. You know, there's one issue which we haven't talked about. The United States has the most uh, old infrastructure as far as passenger railways is concerned. Absolutely. The speeds are abysmal. In fact, India is almost there with the United States on this. If you take entire Europe, virtually very few countries have the kind of speeds that you see on the American uh, railway systems. And there, therefore, Hyperloop suddenly becomes something which is new, attractive, and is going to give them, you know, really, even if they give them 600 kilometers, it'd be something very striking. Because the speeds over there is 160 to 200 kilometers would be considered very fast. And most of the system doesn't work on that either. No, uh, just a small correction there. Just like you're comparing 600 kilometers, you say for the maglev, that's the maximum speed you reach. In high speed rail, the 150 to 200 kilometers that you're saying is an average speed, which you may reach maximum speeds of 350 to 400 kilometers. So the comparison apples to apples would be uh, uh, high speed rail gives you maximum speed of 400 and maglev seems to be able to reach maximum speeds of 600 no, no. Or thereabouts. At the moment they're reaching in tra test tracks, they're reaching about 550 odd uh, kilometers. Yeah, but and they, they say that they can reach yeah, more. So the if average... The future, Raghu, yeah. if you talk about apples to apple, the promise of Hyperloop versus the yeah. promise of Maglev. Maglev says 600 to 600 to 800, Hyperloop says 1200 to 1400. This is the promise. Actually, yeah. they've implemented at the moment, uh, Maglev is about both in uh, the different places, they have run it on a test track of almost uh, 600 kilometers. That's what I'm saying. Also. That's what I'm saying. So that's not the promise. That is the actual. That's what I'm saying. So 600 is what they have reached in Maglev. And the uh, French uh, uh, high-speed rail, uh, the TGT trains uh, regularly reach 400 uh, max speeds, which then averages out over the distance uh, to 250 to 300 thereabouts, like the Shinkansen uh, trains in Japan. So the comparison, I think there in terms of speeds, the Hyperloop is not claiming only this kind of a difference. They are claiming three times uh, the speed and therefore shortening of time 
considerably like the example i gave you of a delhi to mumbai uh, kind of that. travel at about 45 minutes to 50 minutes yeah, I, I, got, I get that but the point is nothing jumps to the top of the tree in one leap so yeah. there is a path so if for instance you go to hyperloop 1200 kilometers well you will have to first they have started at 100 uh, miles okay then they have to go from 100 miles to 1200 they won't do it in one loop shall we say so therefore the issue is really if you take realistically you might say 600 to 800 is the next step implementation wise if it succeeds so that is the the, the infrastructure would have to be based on that yeah, and yeah I don't so see, so and all that we honestly, have been talking all i'm saying is the united states there seems to be the need for a high speed rail particularly given the speeds that you see in the united states today and in terms of intercity if you have a set of cities in which you can connect them to high speed rail then perhaps it would really help the united states in terms of transportation and for that hyperloop or uh, maglev if that is the option then at least it's a uh, something which is uh, starting afresh because they don't have a high speed rail system in the united states but when there is already high speed rail system so you really get high speed rail system maglev hyperloop these are the options then those are the kind of op options that countries will consider and you already said for instance in europe they are not looking at Mag maglev because the high speed railways have enough potential in fact the tgv that you are talking about they have reached speeds of about five cents that's right exactly so exactly. They, therefore that's not such yeah. a issue so, so no all the all the discussion we've had till now are really the hypothetical promise of the uh, hyperloop the hype the hyped hyperloop uh, promise shall we say yeah. uh, whereas once you come down to practicalities there are going to be all kinds of issues uh, that will come up. For example, uh, okay, now you've had a run with two human beings sitting inside over a half kilometer journey. But if you have a 500 kilometer journey running at 1000 kilometers an hour, we have no idea of the kind of safety issues that are going to come up. Therefore, what kind of safety regulations are likely to be uh, required? Therefore, what kind of costs are likely to build in terms of the infrastructure, uh, etc. These are complete unknowns uh, right now. Uh, completely unknown. We don't know them uh, at all. We have no idea about performance of the hyperloop system, of the pressure, uh, low pressure vacuum type maintenance, uh, maintaining that over a long period of time. How that will work, we don't know. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, when Elon Musk has been holding discussions across the US on the Hyperloop, he was reminded quite often that drones, for example, today, the technology may be known, but by the time the regulation to practical applications of drones in civilian um, utilization come about, it has taken more than six years to even reach a stage where regulatory standards can be uh, laid down, safety standards can be laid down, etc. So the practical translation of the hyperloop is, I think, so far down the road that we are not even able to uh, envisage how that works. The same with autonomous vehicles on the roads, except for trucks. Uh, the passenger vehicle segments of autonomous vehicles, we are still many years away from standardized regulatory systems and safety requirements. Let's so talk we don't about even know what the practicalities are likely to be. Let's talk about autonomous vehicles another day because that's really a new kind of worms. Okay, because you talk of artificial intelligence driving vehicles. So that, that part I'll just leave out for the time being. But I just like to conclude that Elon Musk has been propagating this, but he's not putting his money in this. No. The SpaceX, X or the electrical batteries, electrical cars. This is not where he's putting his money. He is, he's letting others put his money, but he's a promoter. He's using his uh, success with electric cars, electric batteries, and of course, overthrowing the Bolivian government for lithium, for all of that, basically. In fact, he, he made that as his tweet, uh, live with it, that you know we can overthrow governments, okay, on the question of Bolivia. 
So all, if we take all of that into account, what we see is Elon Musk wants others to carry this baby. This is not where he's putting his investment. He's putting an investment in SpaceX and of course on the cars. So uh, this is really the high profile hype that he had. So yeah. Elon Musk, after having made a success with cars, electric cars and with the SpaceX is now saying this so that people put in this money. And it could be argued that the main reason for the Hyperloop hype that we've seen, you see a hundred uh, mile per hour would not have created a hype except for the Hyperloop hype already created by Elon Musk so that you can get capital into these companies. Yes. So what you really have is this kind of hype works for essentially raising capital on the money market. And maybe this experiment, therefore, was rushed more with an eye for that than for really proving technology. Yeah, uh, except in this case, of course, you've got that other maverick. He's not an inventor like Elon Musk is, but he's a champion of uh, self-proclaimed champion of these frontier uh, technologies. Uh, Virgin is competing with Elon Musk for space uh, travel. And Richard Branson would like to see himself as this uh, tomorrow man. Uh, and so Richard Branson has put some money into this. And that's as you say, the Virgin. Yeah, that's right, that's the Virgin, Virgin. Uh, uh, Hyperloop uh, system. And they're all eyeing a future uh, prospect of this and are really targeting uh, countries which have underdeveloped rail uh, domestic rail systems and you will see one of the major pushes for this coming in the Middle East uh, area where there is money available and there's a lack of an effective railway system and that's where they're trying to do it trying to tap into the aspirational uh, oil money of the Middle East yeah. and combine it with the uh, show of the uh, High-tech uh, promise uh, right. that Branson brings to the table. So we can expect to see Maglev versus uh, Hyperloop go head-to-head -head on such fancy projects. That's right. Uh, showcase projects in West Asia where they made money. But looking at it at the moment, it looks like it's the real target is not so much West Asia, not so much railway systems, but the share market. And the capital markets could very well can raise money because well that be. is going to determine the future of the hyperloop. That unless there is money, you need a couple of billion dollars yeah. to be able to bankroll a functional system. So yeah, that's because right now, yeah. apart from angel investors and a few uh, uh, multi billionaires who are prepared to invest a few a couple of hundred million dollars, you're not seeing money going beyond that. And I frankly do not expect the share market to respond very well at this stage of development of the technology. No, that is why the hype drug is important. Yeah. Right? Whether it's a Pfizer hype or it is yeah. a Remdesivir yeah. hype that we saw earlier, all of those hypes, I'm not saying none, the Remdesivir didn't pan out, but the Pfizer vaccine may. But a lot of it is targeted at the stock market because you can see the, oh, the ones who start the companies or who are the basic, the major stockholders start selling their shares when the share market goes up after such hype. And we'll have to see and observe whether Branson puts in more money or sells his shares or right. you know, recoups that money very quickly. All I'm right. saying is the technology game is as much about hype and the share market sure. as it is about technology. Sure. On that note, of course, this is, does not mean that the uh, the Hyperloop, therefore, is a failed technology. It is not. The question is the cost benefits we'll have to see. What are the real costs that we'll have to see on the ground? And whether the economies of that systems will make sense. That has been the problem with maglev systems as well, vis-a-vis -vis high speed rail. So all of these things are on the table. But all of that Raghu today shared with us is that this experiment doesn't settle all those questions. It's just that you see well the technology is feasible, which we already knew. We have put two people in the pod to show that yes, human beings can be carried. And that is something which we did not really need to do uh, in order to prove this fact. But on that note, we'll let it go. And we'll meet with Raghu again on such issues as well as following up the Hyperloop system, what happens to that hype 
and how it pans out. Thank you, Raghu, for being with us. For our viewers, do keep watching News Click and do visit our website. Thank <laughs> you.